Hello and welcome to Theology Unleashed. I'm Arjuna and this is the channel where Eastern Theology meets Western Skepticism. Today we've got Joe Schmid and Dr. Howard Resnick on to discuss whether God plays a flute or not. This, this is the pretext, but the, the real argument is if we assume God exists and is the greatest being imaginable, then we can argue about what qualities God would have or which conception of God on offer is, is the greatest. So uh, thanks for coming on, guys. Great to be here. Thank you for this. And yeah, uh, we'll, uh, we'll skip the introductions because we're short on time and people can read about you in the descriptions and follow links to learn more about you and see Joe Schmidt has a really good channel where he does philosophy of religion, which I'm sure most people viewing this are aware of. I uh, highly recommend it. And uh, so, Dr. Resnick, would you like to get us started by giving a little bit of an argument for the Harry Krishna conception of God based on a variation of Anselm's ontological argument? Okay. I, okay I'll, I'll try to be as dogmatic as I can. Um, if I can give sort of a, um, if you look at the ontological argument, you know, there's Anselm's argument, and then I forget who else. I think Augustine did something. And um, it's kind of, you could, sort of a family resemblance. If there, is an on, if there is an ontological argument for God, Anselm being the one who said that God is that being than whom no greater being can be conceived. And then I forget who did it. There's a version than whom no greater being can exist. That's sort of a modern thing, not just conceive, but exist. And then <clears throat> roughly I would present Rupa Goswami's ontological argument, which he made about um, roughly 500 years ago in his book, Bhakti Rasanara Sindhu. The argument goes that because God is infinitely great, the greatest conception of God is closest to the truth. And so it's, it's in that sense, it's not an ontological argument because it's not just going for existence. I, I think Ruva Goswami operated in a culture in which everyone kind of knew that God exists. And if you said God didn't exist, they would sort of look at you like poor guy. So, so therefore they're, they're not just going for the ontology. They're not just going to show that God exists. But assuming that God exists, what's the greatest conception of God? What's the most glorious? What and, and therefore the conception or, or the description that comes closest to God. So as far as arguing for the Krishna, the Krishna conception, <clears throat> um, of course, to make any sense at all of the conception of Krishna, which a lot of intelligent people, you know, were satisfied that is the best conception. You would have to, you would have to be okay with the idea that form, <clears throat> you could say anatomical form, is not necessarily, is not a priori or logically a limiting feature. So if we assume that God is unlimited, and if someone thinks that a form or a body or a spiritual body is necessarily limiting, and therefore it's simply contradictory to say there's an infinite God who has a spiritual body. If someone believes that, then, um, you know, they're not really in this game that we're doing right here. So therefore, <clears throat> I guess I would start by saying that um, form is not necessarily limiting. I mean, form is limiting, I'd say, when you're operating within material space or physical space. And so, for example, <clears throat> the, 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 let's say, three-dimensional perimeter of my body precisely defines where my body begins and ends. And so I am, you know, to my great disappointment, not all-pervading in this body, because I'm right here, I'm actually in Southern California, you know, greetings. And so, but I'm not in New Zealand. I'm not in uh, at Purdue University. I wouldn't want to be at this time of year, although in the summer it might be quite pleasant. And so, um, but if a spiritual form, Krishna in chapter nine of the Gita, I think verses four through six, um, he, he, he talks about pervading this world. And being in all things, yet not being in, in, in him. All things are in him, but they're not in him. And so <clears throat> it's a very different notion of space. It's, it's, a, it's sort of a, um, it's, a, it's a notion of spiritual space. 
So if we say like having a body, in other words, being spatially defined, being defined within three dimensional space by a, by a body, for one thing, it means you're here and not there. Reminds me of that great Beatles song, Here, There, and Everywhere. So that's, I guess that song ultimately is about Krishna. We can appropriate it. That's real cultural appropriation. Then, <laughs> so the, because if, if let's say, let's say God has a spiritual form, and that form is all pervading, then you couldn't say it's necessarily limited because it's here and not there and not everywhere. And um, of course, physical bodies are temporary, but God's body is eternal in this understanding. And you could say, for example, Krishna famously has a body which is the color of a dark blue rain cloud. So you can say, aha, you see it's not pink, it's not yellow. And therefore, it's, it's chromatically limited. <clears throat> but I think the answer would be, first of all, that Krishna has unlimited forms. And so he kind of, you know, kind of moves right across the color spectrum, <laughs> the color wheel. And uh, so to say that God is this and not that, I think it, it is also based on a mistake of thinking, let's say if God has a personal body, to think that he's, in a sense, limited to that body, but God can have infinite bodies and yet be one God, and, and it's still monotheism. <clears throat> God can uh, manifest all kinds of colors and shapes in other ways. And so somehow, in other words, even though we say God has an eternal spiritual body, God is not only the body, he is that person, but he can manifest the whole color spectrum. He can manifest every conceivable and inconceivable shape geometric or otherwise with that within his creation or within his spiritual abode. And so if, if we, at least even hypothetically, if someone can go with this idea just to see where it leads, that God can have an, un, an unlimited spiritual body, which is still, uh, you know, specifically visible. It has certain color, it has certain shape and so on. Then, um, then among, let's say, candidates, because if you look at the Judeo-Christian religions, oftentimes there weren't a lot of candidates. I mean, in the Trinity doctrine, they kind of created their own. Anyway, that's, I won't go there, Trinity doctrine, why I don't think it's actually monotheism. But anyway, if you, um, so, so in India, because of the great variety of claimants, well, I mean, they're not unlimited. For example, Shiva. And many people in India to this day worship Lord Shiva. And then some people worship Shakti, the goddess. And there's, of course, different names for the goddess. And there are even different forms of Krishna or Vishnu. And so, therefore, Rupa Goswami is having this sort of, you could say, in-house discussion. But it's interesting. He's arguing... He's arguing to people. He's, he, he's speaking to people who understand that there are great divine personalities that have spiritual bodies. And yet, you know, like, will the real God please stand up? And so, but that's where his argument is coming from. Maybe, maybe I'll just leave it at that. I've just thrown out a lot of things. It's not like I'm, I haven't really like systematically argued for one point. And so maybe uh, Joe, or or our host, our Jim. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Jar, go for it. Yeah. Oh, that sounds really interesting, and I'm just looking forward to you know learning more and having, you know, just discussing questions about this model of God. I think that's going to be fun. So, um, one thing that I might want to ask is just further clarification on this notion of having a spiritual body, um, at least you know, prima facie, when I think of bodies, I, I, this is probably just my limited experience, but I just think of like the things around us, you know, like this little, what is this? This is a cap to my water bottle, but that's what I think of when I think of like a body. So um, could you just outline what you mean by a spiritual body so I can kind of get a grip on it? Yeah. I'm um, just going to put a light up. Well, it kind of lines up with the famous biblical statement that we're made in the image of God. And so um, 
it sort of reverses the argument of the skeptic. It's not that because we have human bodies that just evolve by themselves, which I think in the face of uh, discoveries in microbiology in the last 20, 30 years is becoming more and more an absurd idea. Just mathematically, the idea that our, our you know, human bodies evolve by themselves just by the laws of nature. Um, but the idea is that we obviously do have human bodies and therefore we project that idea onto God. And of course, the Vaishnava view is exactly the opposite, that we have human bodies because we are part of God and because we are made in the image of God. The idea, the first person to put forward the skeptical argument, I think, at least certainly Western civilization was uh, Xenophanes, who said something like, give oxen yeah. and lions, you know, and so on, had hands and could draw, you know, they would make gods that look like lions or oxen. Or, of course, I mean, the obvious answer to Xenophanes is, hey, guess what? Uh, oxen and lions don't have hands and don't paint pictures. And, you know, let's just think about that for a moment. And so human beings, as we know, certainly in 2022 are capable of uh, almost inconceivable stupidity. <laughs> and yet, true. Yeah. And yet, I mean, of course, not speaking about politicians who are always very intelligent, but so, yeah. So um, as far as, I mean, as far as projection, in other words, we project our humanity or our, you know, human form onto God. Let's think about projection. Because if you say that we just, you know, project onto a so-called God having human form, it's very radical. It's a very radical degree of projection because an example I've given many times and uh, getting tired of giving these same examples for decades, but I never take the time to think of new examples. But okay, here's a new example. Let's say, for example, let's look at the history of art, specifically in the depiction of, let's say, the snow covered Alps, either from the German side or Austrian side or the Italian side or French or whatever. So let's just look at the history of paintings of the Alps or snow-covered Alps. We find is that as Europe, as Western art, I won't say evolved because, because I have very strong views I have on the history of art, but let's say as, as, as European art uh, changed over time, we see that people painted these very same mountains, you could say Mont Blanc, you know, these very same mountains in very different ways, reflecting their culture and their, you know, theories of art and so on and so forth. Or even if you say, you know, or, or let's say if you have, have, have Western artists or then let's, let's bring in, you know, Eastern artists, Japanese, Chinese, Indian, Polynesian. I mean, let's throw everyone in you know, how the human anatomy has been depicted. There are obviously one-dimensional stick figures. There's very sophisticated photographic realism and everything in between, impressionism. And so we see clearly is that different people are imposing their cultural assumptions or their or whatever, or just their culture on the human anatomy. But now it would be silly to assume that there is no human, there are no human bodies. And, and so if people are really seeing something and it really exists, but they impose upon it their culture, their whatever, their taste, that's a much more moderate sense of projection. And so granted, I think the obvious fact that the theologies around the world, whether they're polytheistic or mon or theistic or monistic, whatever, you know, there are different kinds of conceptions of God obviously reflect the ideas, assumptions, culture of different groups of people. But therefore, to come to the radical conclusion that there is no God is, um, 
that 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 would that would require a type of delusion, uh, you know, radical delusion, which I think it it, it would entail a, a um, such a radical type of skepticism, skepticism specifically about human testimony, that um, that it would really problematize the very notion of objectivity, which some people would probably be happy with, like that, anyway, like these postmodernists. But so, I mean, radical skepticism about the value of human testimony because, for example, how do we know there's a real world outside our minds? Well, human testimony. Like science, and right? Uh, how, how do I know that uh, everything around me right now is composed of atoms? Well, because I read it in a science textbook, and that's a form of testimony. And the scientists themselves who are performing the experiment, right, they were testifying to each other, yes, I did the serial dilution by a factor of 10, and they're trusting each other's testimony there. Yeah, Exactly. So radical, radi radi radically problematizing human testimony, I think, is going to sink all ships. So, so if you if you take the idea that God has a human form made in God's image, there's no you can't prove that that's not the case. You can't say, well, no, it's it, we're just projecting our humanity onto a so-called God. You can't prove that's the case, and so. Since human beings are capable of enlightenment, you know, in their at their best, human beings are capable of really achieving uh, extraordinary divine states of consciousness, which says something about human life. It says something very important about human life, about its potential. I think he was human asking about what what this body of Krishna is like. How, how can the body of God not be? You know, because in Christianity, the sort of this idea that matter is profane and then spirit is untouched, but this idea that God has a body, it, it you know, it raises questions about that. How is how is it different that it has a form yeah. and yet it's not okay, profane okay. the way these material bodies are? Well, is, that, is, that, is that is that what you question? Well, I think that's a really interesting um, interpretation of the question. See, I was just kind of looking for some some greater clarification, and I was finding um, what he was saying quite interesting, and I actually think that's a that's a nice sort of bridge into like, how does the Christian or perhaps a more platonic conception of bodies as profane and, you know, spiritual unchangeable world as um, not profane, rather holy. Uh, how does that interact or how does that, you know, contrast with your conception? I mean, I think that's, that's an interesting question. And that's a, that's a good way to push this. Okay. Forward. I would say roughly uh, the Vaishnavas, those who, except Vishnu or Krishna, are, you know, in one sense, roughly speaking, Neoplatonists. In this, in this, although, I mean, we don't say Plato came first, but, but in the sense that, as we know, for everything which exists in a corrupt form in this world, there is a perfect form, eternal form. And Plato himself, actually, Plato himself, I forget the name of the dialogue. I wish I remember. It might have been the Parmenides, but, but I read this. And I remember very clearly, you know, I should have kept my notes, which I lost. But Plato himself is really trying to reconcile two worldviews. And one worldview of Plato is sort of just Plato, the, uh, the, the mystic geometer, in the sense that, you know, for, you know, there's no triangle that we can draw or produce to, you know, in this world, which is absolutely a perfect triangle, but there are eternal perfect triangles. And, and then you have to throw in another assumption, which many Greek philosophers had, which is that if something is perfect, it's unchanging. Mm -hmm. Because it's almost like if you're at the very peak of a mountain, if you take a step in any direction, you're going downhill. And so the idea that if something is perfect, it's kind of frozen in its perfection, like a triangle. And because if you have a perfect triangle and you, you move any of the lines, you're messing up the perfect triangle. And yet Plato himself recognized that, wait a second, because Plato, of course, accepts God and souls. Plato you know, believes in eternal souls. And therefore, how could a perfect soul be unmoving? Like there's 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 change of position. Like I was sitting down, then I stand up, or or when you produce speech, 
by talking, and then of course, you know, your your mouth and your whole vocal apparatus is moving and you're producing different words, or you go from this place to that place. And so Plato recognized that um, a soul, there, you know, soul, there must be the form of soul. There must be a perfect entity, which is a soul. And yet, don't we want souls to be loving and moving and dancing and singing and, and so on and so forth? And so Plato the Geometer was kind of wrestling with Plato, the, the very pious spiritualist. And you, you see, you see Plato as this real theist. You see it clearly in, in the last book he wrote, which was The Laws, which is by far his biggest book. I actually read that book somehow or other. And uh, I, I read it on this uh, beautiful, big balcony overlooking the um, Indian Ocean in Jagannath Puri in India. I went there to get away from all the... Uh, Need to get away from all the uh, you know stress of being a leader in a religious institution, which whew. so so I went to Jagannath where I spent a few months there on the beach on this balcony overlooking the ocean. Then I read the laws by Plato because I, I was working on a comparative philosophy project. And uh, for example, in Plato, um, it's a, basically it's perfect city state 2.0, you know, the republic kind of uh you know, led to a big mess in Sicily. And so Plato's trying, okay, if at first you don't succeed. So it's the second and final attempt to describe what would be an ideal environment for human beings, an ideal city. And a few things I found interesting in that book are that, for example, the greatest crime in that city is sacrilege to desecrate sacred places. Or that, for example, in order to keep, Plato was really kind of, he was really fixed on this idea that how do you keep people united? Because he, he sort of felt in the Peloponnesian War, the, the Spartans were really tight, they were really together. The Athenians were like free thinkers that you know basically lost and it was a disaster. So Plato is really trying to somehow preserve the culture of Athens, but still the type of Spartan discipline and solidarity, which he feels is really needed. So for example, people should eat their meals together, that if every family takes their meals privately, because you know breaking bread together, sharing meals is so important, that um, if everyone you know, eats privately, how do you keep a society united? And, but then he also says that, um, you know, the greatest crime is to desecrate holy places, of which there'll be many in the city. And also, um, every month, there should be a community festival, and it should always be a religious festival. So it's interesting to see how Plato, so going back to the form of God, or the form of Krishna, um, I would say Plato was on the trail of this, you could say, hybrid or integrated conception where you could have perfection, you can have a three-dimensional, spatially defined perfection, and yet at the same time, uh, it moves, it's real, it's alive. And, you know, Plato often compares God to the sun. So in the Vaishnav concept, Krishna appeared as a cowherd boy. It's kind of humble on his part. I mean, he could have appeared as anything, could have appeared as a great ruler, but he appeared as a coward boy, at least in his childhood. And um, there's also an important aspect of Vaishnavism where worshiping the majesty of God, um, God is the omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent, so holy that don't even think about seeing him or, or like in, in a rabbinical interpretation, which I think was very unfortunate and wrong. The idea that it's such a great sin to uh, take the Lord's name in vain, that if you never take the Lord's name, then you can't take it in vain because you never take it. I think that was a really bad decision. And um, 
it's not biblically required. It was just, uh, you know, someone thought they had a bright idea. But of course, they end up having all kinds of other names for God. They say, well, it's not really the name of God, but hey, you know, it's a name and you use it to call God. So I won't get into that. But so intimacy. So the idea that our, our human-like bodies, or not our human bodies, are really made in God's image. And there are obviously relevant differences in the spiritual body. They don't have kind of some of the nasty, putrid aspects of our bodies. So, so that then here's the Neoplatonic part. The Neoplatonic part is that this world really is just a corrupted or imperfect reflection of a perfect world. And I know myself, even though I'm, I, I'm trying to be a transcendentalist and practicing bhakti yoga and everything, there is something very natural about having a body. I mean, it's not like through spiritual practice, one day you say, ooh, this is so weird having two arms and two legs and, and a face and smiling and God, this is, I can't relate to this at all. It's just totally not. No, if, if it's just like I'm wearing clothes right now being a you know conservative religious practitioner I, I wear clothes and so um so the idea is you know i'm moving and my clothes are moving so it, it, there's a sense in which it's very natural for us to have a human body arms and legs and eyes and other senses and so you know my teacher probably would say that's because in our eternal state in our liberated eternal state we really do this although in this world, I'm not the body, I'm the soul in the body, but on the spiritual plane, you really are your spiritual body. So there's no dichotomy and there's no ignorance, there's no, there's no self-realization required because at every moment you are yourself. As a, and so, um, and, then, and then God is an infinitely beautiful spiritual form, but he also has unlimited, unlimited forms. And Antarupa is found in one text, which means infinite forms. And so personally, I'm so happy just, you know, being a person and being able to move around and do things that, um, and use all my five senses that I would not, you know, for all the, we used to say all the tea in China, that's an old 50s expression, but of course that's probably politically incorrect now because it's, anyway. So, um, but yeah, the idea of, of getting to be me or remaining me and not, you know, becoming some impersonal blob or something, which to me would be my worst nightmare. My worst nightmare would be not to be a person because it's just so wonderful to be a person, to have free will and to do all things that persons can do. And so it's so wonderful because ultimately it's our divine nature. God is, is an eternal person. Krishna calls his body in the Bhagavad Gita, Chintya Rupam, an inconceivable, beautiful body. And um, so and that's, that's the Neoplatonic part. This world is just a reflection of that higher world. So I hope that, I hope we're making a little progress trying to uh, explain these things. Maybe yeah, we can, no, that's all really. I was going yeah, no, to say. Yeah. say. Oh, you, you're cutting out a little bit. I can't. I, oh, yeah, you, at least start. for me, I can't really hear. Okay, yeah, I'll just go. Yeah, what, what I was going to say is, um, yeah, that I think that does clear up a lot of things. As to, just to build on some of the stuff that um, you said there, um, I think you were talking at some point there about how uh, God appears in various forms, for instance, or manifests in different ways. Uh, one of them you're talking about, uh, what was it, the coward boy, right? Um, does this mean that... Uh, so, so I just for a background, I like to study this model of God. This, this is not to say I accept it. In fact, I, I reject it. But it's called um, classical theism, and it's it's a very kind of high octane classical theism where God is utterly unchanging. God is utterly timeless, utterly transcendent. Um, he cannot change in any way, shape, or form. He's uh, purely actual, pure being itself, and we can only make analogous predications and you know things like that. So. With that in mind, would your model of God or the way that you kind of conceive of God, would that involve God changing in certain ways uh, because he's manifesting in one way at one time and another way at another time or something like that? And if so, it might be interesting for us to go over um, at least 
one of the uh, prominent arguments for divine immutability, which is, you know, as you probably, you were actually articulating it earlier, like, hey, if God changed in any way, shape or form, he'd be either be getting better or worse, but he couldn't get better because he's the best possible. He's the best conceivable. Uh, and he also couldn't get worse uh, because, oh my goodness, that means like, I don't know. God's getting worse. That seems repugnant, right? Uh, surely, if he, <laughs> surely, surely, then he wouldn't be perfect to begin with, because perfection has a kind of stability, as it were. Uh, so, yeah, he couldn't get better or worse. But if he could change, he could get better, uh, worse, and that, hence he that, can't change. Yeah, that's a that's a very good point. That's, those are it's a, that's an excellent topic you brought up. First thing that occurs to me is to say, you know, God is sort of like the unknowable because he's so great. I think that's pathetic, because. For example, uh, you know, I had the great blessing, the great blessing of being born to really good parents. By the way, Arjuna, it looks like he just expanded himself. Yes, we, we have a, a duplication. Maybe it's God manifesting in a different form, <laughs> multiple forms. <laughs> this is my, my solution, solution to my, my take problems. So um, so when I, I, had, I had really, really very loving, good parents, which is having seen a lot of the world, I've understood more and more what a blessing that was. And so when I was just a little, little thing externally, and obviously I couldn't understand my parents because, you know, they were adults. They were functioning, intelligent adults. And I was just a little, little thing. At the same time, as loving parents, they were always there for me. And the greatest pleasure for loving parents, really, is to see your child grow up well and to see how your child more and more understands you as a parent and, and can reciprocate with you. It's not just give me this, give me that. But when you see your own child really understand you and love you and reciprocate your love, so there's no greater pleasure for a parent than to be known by and loved by the child. And so to say that God eternally is just kind of playing games with us and being God, he could reveal himself, herself, themself, itself. And I don't get into the pronoun quagmire. So God, anyway, I'll control myself, not comment on what I think of that whole thing. So, um, so to say there's a God, I mean, God obviously couldn't be infinitely good if he doesn't love us. And if God does love us, he would want us to know him, her, them. And so, therefore, the idea of a God who just sort of this cold perfection never lets his own children know him, to me, is absurd. And, of course, by using the word children, I'm kind of, you could say, well, that's, you know, begging the question or something. But... What we find in this world, if you look at the evolutionary scale, and I'm not talking about, you know, purely physical evolution, intelligent design, but what we know is there is, there is a, a fossil record. And so, but what we, but even never mind, I mean, never mind uh, diachronic evolution. Let's look at synchronic varieties in the sense that some creatures obviously have bigger brains and, you know, more cognition than others. But what we find is, that as creatures evolve, you know, however you want to take that word, they become more personal. They become more, and like cocker spaniels are more personal than amoebas. And if you think about it, if you meet some person who treats you impersonally, you don't think that person's evolved. You think, you know, it's a, I don't know, a jerk. So... <clears throat> We appreciate people and, 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 and consider them to be more evolved, the more personal they are. And Is so that an God, equivocation on the word personal? Equi equivocation? No. I, th I think it's, it's very straightforward and we all know what the word means, unless you know, we happen to unfortunately be so. Well, I mean, when we say personal versus impersonal in the context of, you know, is God a person or is he, you know, an unembodied mind or so to speak? Is that the same kind of personal and personal as someone who gives you the cold shoulder and is a bit rude versus somebody who understands you and interacts? Well, if God is unknowable, if God is unknowable, it is, the, it is an epistemic, it is an epistemic cold shoulder. 
I, and, and, and so the, the point I'm driving at here is why if God creates the world and didn't just like, you know, it's like an involuntary creative burp or something. I mean, assume that God intentionally created the world because otherwise how could he be God if he just, whoops, I didn't mean to do that. So if, if God intentionally created the world and he creates a world in which the more intelligent, the more evolved creatures are, the more personal they are, the more personally sensitive they are, how could that not tell us anything about the world? And frankly, you know, just cold, neutral cognition, I think, can be almost insufferably boring. And so, you know, maybe, you know, someone just never had a loving relationship in high school or something or college. But the point is, I mean, love does make the world go round. And there's something so beautiful, so powerful, so valuable about love, especially the more the love is selfless, the more the love is not just uh, someone, you know, gratifying themselves. It's, it, it's actually you really love somebody. I mean, for someone to say that God does not love, frankly, I'm tempted to say that, you know, I feel sorry for that person. They've never really had those kinds of amazing experiences. Because anyone who has experienced how beautiful and how powerful love is would never want to posit a supreme being that just gives the whole creation the cold shoulder. So, and, and as soon as you say love, we have, a, we have a personal God. And why not? I mean, what is there? What, 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 let's say, what is there of value in impersonal cognition, which is lacking in a personal God? It's obvious that a huge most valuable component is lacking in an impersonal God, namely personal consciousness. So what is the advantage? What is, because there is an impersonal sort of cognition, which is called Brahman or impersonal Brahman in the Vaishnava tradition. But what, what possible good thing is present in cold impersonal cognition that is not present in a personal deity. I'm yeah. open for suggestions there. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm kind of honestly with you. Like uh, you said near the beginning, which is relevant here, that um, if we have a model of God on which God is infinitely great, well then um, at least the, we should think that if we have a greater conception of God, then that gives us some reason to think we're closer to the truth, right? So the greater the conception of God is, the closer you are to the truth. And that's, I think... Uh, like a reasonable guy here. And so if it, if it strikes us as obvious that um, uh, a loving God that can be personally involved and interact with really uh, God's children, that seems to be much more great, much more supreme, much more beautiful, much more God really than uh, one that is impersonal and uh, like uninvolved or things like that. So um, now I, I should note for the audience uh, of course, that I'm, I'm not saying here that um, uh, the classical theism that I described earlier uh, says that God is impersonal, but there are views, there are views which say that God is impersonal, and right now we're kind of just interacting with those. So just for the audience, that that was just a note. But I, I'm with sure. you there, um, and just the fact that it strikes us as, as obvious that um, such a God would be so much greater if it could love and be personally involved with with a creation that that should give us good reason to think that, um, given that God is the greatest conceivable, greatest possible, however you want to catch that out, given that that's the case, well then we have reason to think that, um, yeah, God actually would be personal, would love in in such and such a way, be involved and uh, in you know engage in meaningful reciprocal relations with creatures, um, which might even arguably be the best good that could obtain um, uh, between God and, and creatures if God chooses to create. So, yeah. Joe, I have a question for you. Um, like I've, I've had a few discussions with Ryan Mullins and he seems to be on board with the Hare Krishna conception of you more so than Christians who take to classical theism, which makes me wonder how much, you know, the, the competing, uh, the view that our tradition competed with historically has been Advaitavad, which is a kind of impersonalism. Uh, yeah. And you see a lot of Christians who like classical theism take to Advaitavad. They find the teachings of Adi Shankaracharya very interesting. Um, so I'm wondering if you could comment if you think there's any similarities between the classical theism or neoclassical theism debate or whatever the all competing view might be and the debate between the Vaishnava conception of God and the sort of impersonal view of Brahman being the absolute that you get in the Advaitavad tradition. 
Yeah, no, that's that's a great connection. And I do think that there are tight similarities there. Now, there are, of course, some relevant dissimilarities. So, for instance, uh, while some people might conceive of Brahman as impersonal, the classical theists are going to want to say that God is personal, at least analogously so. So maybe we don't use it in the exact same sense in which we do with us, but um, still God is uh, a person in some sense. He has an intellect in some sense, a will. He can will the good of creatures and so on and create. That's what the classical theist is going to want to say. Um, but Yes, people like David Bentley Hart, for instance, uh, draws a lot on this tradition, and uh, he really thinks that um, the those who believe in an impersonal Brahman are really just kind of approximating the classical theistic God. They don't have a fully adequate description because they don't recognize it, at least in some sense, it is personal, um, but they're very, very close. And so that does show you that, at least for many classical theists, their conception um, of God of the divine is quite similar to the, the to this Brahman conception. After all, like you will hear classical theists say, yeah, God is just a uh, being itself, pure consciousness itself. Um, and when you start and like, you know, there, there are no, there's nothing intrinsic to God that's numerically distinct from God. So God's identical to everything in him. Uh, the, when you start fleshing these out, it does start to sound quite a quite, quite similar to how, how people describe this impersonal with Brahman. Um, but, uh, and, you know, God is just this, this principle whereby everything exists and through which everything exists. Um, so, yeah, th there, there are tight similarities there, but there's, there's no strict identity. And I can definitely see how Ryan Mullins would think that the, the Harry Krishna view that you guys accept would be closer to neoclassical theism, because it, it, seems to, it seems to really involve God in this kind of reciprocal relationship with creatures where God is involved, God is responsive, God is loving with his children and so on, um, which would contrast with this kind of high octane classical theism where God is impassable, can't be affected, moved or influenced by anything outside of himself. He just has this pure undisturbable state of blessedness or happiness, which is his single cognitive state, which timelessly obtains and which he's numerically identical with. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I think I, <laughs> I know. I think I would side with Ryan Mullins there, uh, at least by my lights, in thinking um, that. Well, they can, maybe, maybe, I'm sorry. Maybe I could pose a question. You could play the devil's advocate. I love playing devil's advocate. Okay, classical theist advocate. So, if God is, as you just described, sort of sublimely self-absorbed then is he aware of us? So the classical theists will say that, yes, God is aware of us, God knows us, but there is no direction of, see, the direction of explanation there is not from us somehow impacting God's cognitive state or awareness. Rather, um, God, the, the direction of explanation is the other way around. God in causing us to be, God in sustaining our being from moment to moment he knows himself perfectly. And so he knows his causal act perfectly. And so he knows that he's bringing us about and that we are existing in such and such a way. And so in virtue of that, he is aware of us and he can will the good of us. After all, he's willing our existence. He's willing our being. And in virtue of that, he wills the good of us. And so uh, under prominent conceptions of, of love within the classical theistic tradition, um, something is loving to the extent that it, it wills the good of another. Um, and also- but, but wills... that, but that, Okay, but if you take that willing the good of another, let's say for example, someone has a child Mm -hmm. And they will the good of the child, but they see the child is kind of going the wrong direction. And so is it just a passive will? In other words, it, it, it seems to me, it sounds to me like, okay, I have a child. I want my child to be healthy and have a good life. My child is uh, just opened a box of rat poison and is starting to eat it. But my Love for the child does not go beyond willing. It doesn't, there's no question of an intervention. There's no question of a communication. I just, uh, I just will the good. And when I see someone doing the wrong thing, so, so what does it mean? See, what, what I'm kind of uh, getting stuck on here in, in, in that, that idea which you laid out is that I will the good. I want someone to be happy in, in the right way. And yet when I see someone self-destructing or doing something that I know will lead to great pain and suffering, there's nothing about me which wants to intervene. Because if God is God and God wills to intervene, then God can intervene. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not really grasping the idea of loving someone, wishing the good for them, 
but doing nothing to actually help them. Yeah, so what they would say is, I mean, of course, some uh, classical theists don't take particular religious traditions, but a lot of them will. So a lot of them will, for instance, be Christians, a lot of them will be uh, Muslims, a lot of them will be Jews, and so on. So they probably would say um, that God's lovingness, God's loving us, does partly consist, of course, in his willing our good, but also taking steps to actualize that good and taking steps to realize it. And that might involve God intervening in some way. Now, interestingly, uh, the the way, like the way he's going to be intervening is, of course, just, it's not sort of a responsive intervening. It's not like um, God is impacted in some way, like the, the crying of the creature or um, the, the creature's going wrong impacts God in some way, and then he responds to that. It's more purely active. Uh, it's like God is taking the full reins, as it were, and he's actualizing, um, I don't even know how to precisely say it. But it seems to me, it it, it seems to me to be kind of, well, to be honest, bad philosophy. Because, (laughs) I mean, we accept that God does not suffer the way a human suffers. Like, let's say I'm attached to someone, some other human being, Mm -hmm. family, friend, you know, whatever. And uh, that person somehow is in a difficult situation. So materially, I really suffer. So we're saying no, that God knows that every that within every body, every living body is a soul. The soul is eternal. And, and even when we're suffering, it's just because we've gotten entangled in this virtual reality machine of the body. And we're imagining, you know, that something's happening to us because we're taking the body to be the self. So God is aware of all that, and God doesn't feel, let's say, material grief. Mm-hmm. But he does have spiritual, pure compassion. Mm-hmm. And so it seems that, like the, 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 the worldview that you're laying out for us, it seems that they're saying things and then rejecting the obvious implications of what they're saying. Yeah, so... A lot, of, a lot of times what they like to do is they want to maintain that, for instance, uh, God is just and merciful. Or any, they also oftentimes, if they're Christian classical theists, they want to maintain that God's wrathful. Now, there's a prima facie difficulty there. Uh, that God is what? Wrathful, like God has wrath oh, towards wrath. sins. You know, um, they want to maintain yeah, yeah. Well, if, if they're Christian theists, it does say that in the Bible, you know, the Old Testament and so on. So God has wrath against sinners. Uh, he judges sinners and so on. So, right. I mean, we, we, we don't have to focus on the specifics, uh, specific okay. examples. My point, my point was um, just more broadly, like they want to say these sorts of things now, but there's a prima facie difficulty there because the doctrine of divine impassibility traditionally, again, they want to say God is totally uninfluenced, unaffected by or not impacted upon, not impinged upon by things outside of God. Um, and so it's not as though sinners are like stirring up in God some kind of negative emotion. And in fact, they also say that um, God's emotional state, if we can describe it that, I mean, we have to be rough in analogous terms, but God's emotional state is one of pure undisturbed happiness and bliss and blessedness. And so However, it's, it's prima how, facie. Yeah. yeah, so here's, but it's okay, here's the difference. Here's what we would say. That they are not recognizing that there are spiritual emotions which are not material emotions. Like materially, if I care about someone and that someone is suffering, I suffer. Mm -hmm. If I really care about someone and they're suffering, I mean, then, then, then what's, what's it there? There's an old uh, Jewish saying that a mother is only as happy as her most unhappy child. Mm -hmm. And so, so it seems that if we accept the idea that there are spiritual emotions, which are not material emotions, there are spiritual emotions that can be compassion, you can care. Because the idea, I mean, I agree that a perfect God is not compatible with, uh, let's say, mundane emotions or mundane emotions. We can't attribute mundane emotions to God, but there can be spiritual emotions. There can be a compassion an empathy, which is not mundane and doesn't involve mundane psychology and doesn't involve God or, or even a, a pure soul uh, actually somehow being dragged into the realm of, of, um, of material unhappiness or pain. And so 
And we would agree with these people and saying, yes, even when we suffer, God does not experience mundane emotions, but he does have spiritual emotions. And, and unless God had spiritual emotions, why would he create the world at all? I mean, why would he cause souls to exist? Because if you just don't care or you don't have any feeling about it, why, for example, create the world in such a way that virtue is its own reward? You know, why create incentives? Because we know that when we're really at the top of our moral game, you know, really behaving properly, that we're much happier than when we're being selfish or greedy or exploitative. And, and so the whole universe is designed in such a way that virtue is rewarded. And so how could we, so it seems to me that in their, in their anxiety to uh, avoid the conception of God, including mundane emotions, that they really have thrown out the baby with the bathwater, they've forgotten or just don't know there can be spiritual emotions which don't compromise God's perfection, but also save him from the you know charge of just being a jerk. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you're really hitting on a lot of uh, the criticisms that proponents of divine passibility raise towards impassibility. So um, there's not much that I could say because with at least a number of those, uh, I'm I'm sympathetic with a lot of those criticisms. Um, now, uh, what classical theists might try to say Joe's is that- Joe's got three, three hour lectures on his channel that discuss this topic. Who does? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Joe, Joe does. Yeah, three, maybe, yeah, even on four sometimes it gets up to four, but uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, I mean, again, I, I do have some sympathies with um, criticisms that divine passibilists like Ryan Mullins uh, level towards divine impassibility and you're raising some of them here. So uh, <laughs> uh, I can't really say too much in return, but what the classical theist sometimes says with respect to things like, for instance, passion or compassion and things like that. Um, it's not that God has some kind of internal state uh, by which he feels some kind of uh, emotion of compassion, but his compassion instead consists in his causing things that a characteristically compassionate person, let's say, would do. That, that's, for instance, how a lot of them analyze God's justice and wrath. So God's wrathful towards sinners, not in the sense of having some internal emotional state of anger, but instead in the sense of, you know, uh, justly distributing uh, punishments and awards. But that sounds where, like, that, or, sounds, but that just sounds like an automaton. That sounds like you know a very sophisticated computer that you program to reward virtue and, and punish vice. So to say that God just does the right thing, but there's has no feeling associated with what he's doing, that seems like really that seems like something less than human, not more than human. Because if I, you know, if I just compulsively, let's say, give food to poor people and I have no idea what I'm doing, I don't feel any compassion, I'm not really feeling that I want to help these people, I'm just sort of compulsively giving, you know, food to poor people, that's not a superior state, it's kind of a demented state. And so, again, the problem with this classical theism seems to be they just don't know that there are spiritual emotions. There are spiritual emotions which do not in any way taint the purity of God or diminish his perfection. In fact, God, it seems to me, would be severely lacking if he didn't love us. I mean, how can you say a creature that doesn't love is greater than a creature that does love? I mean, that, that seems bizarre. And, and if God, let's say, is arranges the world in such a way to help us in different ways. How can you say that someone does the right thing but has no feelings about it? There's no love. There's no, somehow you're glorifying God by stripping out every admirable, noble feeling from him and saying he doesn't love us. He doesn't feel anything. He doesn't feel a desire to help us. He's just kind of mechanically, you know, just sort of, you know, doing the right thing. Wow. I mean, it seems like such a bizarre conception of God, very artificial, very forced, and, and, and it's based not, I think, on anything like serious intuition, serious spiritual intuition, but just like this sort of cold, logical thing, well, you know, emotions are imperfections, 
and therefore strip out the emotions and just being totally unaware. Because just as we're made in God's image, along the same lines, our feelings are in the image of God's feelings. So let's say when I feel compassion, it's maybe imperfect, maybe mixed with a certain pride at being compassion. It may be mixed with a certain partiality, like I'm especially compassionate to people I know, my family, my close friends. And so my compassion has certain flaws in it. It's not pure compassion, but the way to get to the perfect God, divine compassion is not by stripping out awareness, but it's by removing the imperfections, which would be, for example, material attachment or material pride or partiality or whatever. You get perfection by taking away whatever is impure, not just by killing the whole thing and conceiving of a God that, that feels no love, which is God. Who would want a God like that? Like, I think I'll pass on that one. <laughs> yeah. so, well, so, Joe, how yeah. are you doing on time? Yeah, so my friend is uh, going to be here in about um, five minutes, so we might just want to start um, wrapping up and saying some final words, uh, you know, maybe things we've taken away. or. Well, I had a great good time. I really, it's really a pleasure speaking to you, Joe. And yeah, I, I, mean, have, I, I have no yeah, doubt. I, was, you, I, mean, I have no doubt you'll be very successful in your career. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I mean, I uh, also quite enjoyed this, and it's nice contrasting the kind of internal uh, debates that you, Arjuna, were saying there with the kind of classical theism versus neoclassical theism there. And it's also nice um, that to hear that the kind of criticisms that Ryan Mullins and other divine possibility theorists raise in, in philosophy of religion are kind of raising their head here as well, especially near the end that um, uh, Dr. Resnick was, was raising. So yeah, um, I, I quite enjoyed this. So thank you, uh, Arjuna, for having this. And thank you, uh, um, yeah, Dr. Resnick. Cool. Is that a wrap or do you want to make any final comments? So have we convinced you that God plays a flute? Uh, you've actually, I mean, you made me a little bit more open to it just by, um, uh, I mean, I thought the discussion about uh, form not necessarily being a limiting feature. I thought that was, um, I don't know, it kind of opened me up. Yeah, may I just give a quick example? I think I, I, I read this in a book. Fortunately, I didn't always, uh, I think it was on the Orphix. There was the idea that form actually breaks down limits. For example, if we just make sound by grunting or just, you know, scream, whatever. But if you look at musicology and I, you know, what I do to relax, I, I play sort of Baroque music on the keyboard, especially Bach and Handel. And um, I, I'm just amazed and awed by counterpoint, you know, Baroque sort of linear counterpoint. And um and so if, they, if you just make noise, what they can do, what they're doing is they're shaping sound. Or if you look at language, as we know, language is much more sophisticated and complex than people imagine, which is why when you call up some company, you get this stupid robot that never really understands what you're saying on the other end. And so, so as you form sound into language and you, and you have great works of literature, as you form sound into this really celestial music, as you form, you know, let's say just color and shape into great works of art. In all these cases, we're finding that the more you shape these things, the more unlimited you're someone who's just a master, let's say of musical composition is breaking down the limits. And, and so that you can express the most subtle, the most complex, the most amazing shades of emotion of and not just emotion of ideas because music is a language and you know and and the great composers are really speaking to us when i was at harvard um the dean of my graduate school was actually a music professor and he wrote a famous book on um bach and he concluded that because bach was very influenced by newton or leibniz and so Bach, because, you know, music is, as, as, as um, Pythagoras said, you know, you know, music and mathematics and, and cosmology and all that. And so that Bach was actually offering almost like mathematical arguments for the existence of God through, you know, through music. And, and so, or for example, let's say you see a body that strikes you as beautiful. And, you know, let's say you're, you know, you're not lusting after it, but you just, mm -hmm. in, as a gentleman, you just appreciate that's a very beautiful body. And so 
that there's no limit. In other words, we can imagine a face, a body becoming more and more beautiful, the more perfectly it's shaped. And so we actually find in this world is if you remove shape and form, rather than great music, let's say you just get noise, or rather than great poetry or great literature, you just get babbling, or rather than, let's say, just exquisite beauty of face or, or body, you just get, uh, you know, a lump or, or just, you know, just some formless whatever. And so we can give innumerable examples where form is increasing value, meaning. And so why not project, I think this is an intelligent projection, that why should this be finite? What if ultimately there is an infinitely perfect body, an infinitely perfect face, infinitely beautiful music? And so, and so, there, and so, therefore, and it's, there, the idea that form is limiting, I think, is uh, is easy to problematize. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And so, uh, although Arjuna, I wasn't uh, convinced fully, but I was made more open to it. So that is at least some progress. But uh, yeah, I've probably um, got to head out some sometime real soon. So thank you guys both. Okay, well, yeah, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Cool. Yeah, let's wrap time. it up. But yeah, thanks for that. It was a great discussion. Hopefully, we can do it again sometime. We'll have to get you yeah. on with a real classical theist. That'll be fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it won't be fun for God. God will just be like undisturbed. But, uh... <laughs> All right. Right. Cool. We'll, we'll wrap it up there. So thank you, Arjun, and thank you, Joe. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Sweet. Yep. Uh, I'm going to take off. Sorry for the abrupt ending. But, uh, no, no. Very funny.